is George Glanville's decision against Attorney Steele. Hold on. Sorry, Mr. Jingles. Order of contempt and incarceration for Brian Steele. During the proceedings in the above styled case on the afternoon of June 10th, 2024, one of the two representatives for defendant Jeffrey Williams, Mr. Brian Steele, took the podium and stated to the court that he had been informed of an ex parte communication which took place in the court's chambers that morning. The only parties present for this ex parte matter were the court, the court's official court reporter, representatives from the state, the state's witness, Mr. Kenneth Copeland, and counsel for Mr. Copeland. In addition to the court's serious concern with how this information was improperly disclosed to defense counsel, Mr. Steele made several claims regarding the sum and substance of that the communication that the court found troubling. But of course you did. He called you out on doing something illegal, Judge Glanville. The court having told Mr. Steele multiple, multiple times that he needs to tell the court how he came into that information, and the court having explicitly warned Mr. Steele that he faces contempt of court should he not comply, the court find Mr. Steele have repeatedly refused to follow the court's order. And then he cites uh, OCGA this. Then he quotes Sivetson. And he quotes, every court has the power to compel obedience to its orders and to control the conduct of persons connected with the judicial proceeding. One who disobeys an order or command of the court may be may be found in criminal contempt. Before a person may be held in contempt for violating a court order. You can see that. Yep. The order should inform him in definite terms as to the duties thereby imposed upon him, upon him, and the command must therefore be expressed rather than implied. And the question of whether contempt has occurred is for the trial court, and its determination will be overturned only if there has been a gross abuse of discretion. <laughs> In my opinion, way over that line. Once an act has been determined to constitute contempt of court, the action the court takes to deal with the contempt determines whether the contempt is deemed criminal contempt or civil contempt. The, the, the distinction between criminal and civil contempt is that criminal contempt imposes unconditional punishment for prior contempt to preserve the court's authority and to punish disobedience of its order. Now, remember, most of the afternoon, Mr. Glanville used criminal contempt in order to get Mr. Uh, Steele to answer. That is not within the rules of criminal contempt. That is in the rules of civil contempt. So, and it's on the record. And he's still flowering the language. Direct summary criminal contempt, which arises in the presence of the court and tends to scandalize it and hinder or obstruct the orderly process of the administration of justice, the preser preservation of order and decorum in the court, etc., is exempt from the due process requirements of notice and hearing. How the attorney Steele did his job zealously advocating for his client because he got notice of an illegal ex parte meeting and information and the information that was disclosed in that meeting that yeah it is it scandalizing the court yeah, sure because judge glanville fucked up and then he quotes Moody, blah, blah, blah. Accordingly, it is hereby ordered that, pursuant the court, uh, court's authority under OCGA, the court holds Mr. Steele in direct criminal contempt for failure to comply with this court's order. It is further ordered that Mr. Steele shall be taken into custody, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, we all will know all this. 20 days served on weekends, which Mr. Steele will serve in the same jail as Jeffrey Williams. 
what he fails to mention here is how he tried to force Mr. Steele to reveal over and over and over again after Mr. Steele was held in criminal contempt. He is not allowed, George Glanville is not allowed to do that. The second he says, you are in criminal, direct criminal contempt, which was explained to him by Ashley Merchant yesterday. As Papa D. Rose says, he essentially wrote his walking papers because this forces an appeal from uh, Tony Steele, which has been written for uh, uh, his wife and Mrs. Steele wrote two appeals. And then I also believe that Ashley Merchant either already written one or hasn't filed yet or is about to file another appeal to the appeals court. And I would assume when that gets official, and I will read from that, because that will be extremely spicy, because they have nothing to hold them back anymore. Mr. Steele is already held in contempt. If he kept threatening with it, they might have taken a step back. Okay, maybe he won't, maybe he won't. But now he did. Now there's no stopping. This is getting real. Now, as I said before, Mr. But let's just read from it. Here is an excerpt from the actual rules. Hold on. There. Let's get that up there instead. In a summary contempt proceeding, objectively observable and describable behavior that causes an articulable interference with the administration of justice must be demonstrably present, which means it has to interrupt. It didn't. The trial has continued. Both the bad conduct and its adverse impact must be set forth with specificity. I didn't read any specificity in the in Judge Glanville's uh, order, in the ruling by the court that finds as a matter of fact that no justification exists for the alleged cont contemnor's behavior. Wasn't Mr. Steele justified? I believe he was justified. He got knowledge that there was an ex parte meeting between the judge and the prosecutor where they coerced and colluded to get Woody to keep testifying. And allegedly in that meeting, Woody confessed. And the judge is, was prepared to keep that a secret until after the trial. If these procedural steps are taken verbally, as is usually the case with a court trying to restore some immediate order in its proceedings, the judge must, as soon as possible, create a written record that preserves the following. One, the notice to the perpetrator of the offensive conduct subject to being viewed as contemptuous due to its actual or imminent adverse impact. Two, a detailed description of the bad acts committed or omitted by the perpetrator despite a contemporaneous warning by the court to refrain. Three, an explanation of the deteriorous impact on the court's operation or its integrity. The trial continues. This fails on its face. For a recitation of the perpetrator's reason given as justification for their questionable conduct. Judge didn't write down anything about why Mr. Steele acted why he did. Five, a finding of fact by the judge of direct conduct interfering with the court's administration of justice or imminently threatening such consequences. Six, an order declaring the respondent in contempt of court and imposing a statutorily authorized sanction because the order does not sufficiently set forth the words or acts or circumstances upon which the trial judge found... Yeah, this is from the Schaefer... Uh, uh, 
Schaefer Act. We are unable to review the court's judgment to determine whether the evidence was sufficient for the trial court to conclude beyond a reason, re reasonable doubt that Schaefer was guilty of conduct constituting direct criminal contact for which summary adju adju adjudication and punishment was authorized. Colin v. State, Bryant, yeah. So this was in the Schaefer trial. And reading on its face, the appeals court's decision, there is no way in, there's no way, in my opinion, that this should survive an appeal. Now, you, you never know. Why? Because judges likes protecting judges. That's just a matter of fact. But this is so over the top. I... I just can't see. I, I can't. I can't see this surviving. And there are Georgia-based lawyers, appellate lawyers, who are all stating the same thing. What the fuck?